Welcome to the final fast pitch session of the ARPA-E Summit. The theme of this session is about electricity. How do we use it? Why do we need to use it? How do we produce it? How do we reduce how we use it? And so we're going to talk about those topics today. So the first speaker is going to be Grigory Soloveitchik about how to electrify the industrial sector. Then I'm going to talk about nuclear reactors. Then Scott Shu is going to talk about fusion. Michael Hadi is going to talk about next-gen HVAC. And Greg Thiel is going to talk about how to take the hot air out of drying. And so without further ado, we'll have Grigori get started. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning. My name is Grigory Soloveitchik. I'm program director at RPIE. Uh, and uh, I will talk about uh, electrification of industrial sector. So first, what is industrial sector? Basically, it's everything around us. Uh, it's our cloth, it's metal for our cars, uh, it's a cement for our buildings, uh, and uh, it consumes a lot of energy, and it emits uh, gigatons of CO2 and some other pollutants. And in this picture, you can see a, a cement plant and steel plant, and you see how dirty they are right now. They use uh, fossil fuels uh, to heat uh, and reduce uh, iron ore, for example, for steel, and break uh, minerals uh, to produce cement. So, if you're looking at uh, gigatons uh, and quads of energy, that's uh, how uh, industrial sector uh, fares. So it's about 23% of total uh, global CO2 emissions. And uh, it's notoriously hard to decarbonize uh, and uh, reduce uh, the energy consumption. This is uh, this picture you can see uh, that uh, steel and cement are probably one of the most highly polluted uh, industries and very hard to decarbonize. And uh, if you look at what is exactly manufacturing, what are uh, process we use, then uh, you see that electricity is already there, so it's but a small part of our total energy in uh, the processes. Uh, and another two big uh, sources of energy is the fuel itself, or which could be natural gas or coal uh, or oil and the steam, which is generated basically from the same fuel, okay? Uh, when we talk about electrification of industrial sector, we think, okay, we will electrify, but what the goal is electrification? First of all, we need to reduce energy consumption, so increase efficiency, and second, reduce emissions. Can we do our uh, kill both birds with one stone? Probably yes. Uh, at the right side of this slide, you also see that the different uh, industries are differently react to uh, electrification or decarbonization efforts. For example, or in our kind of a brownish column, this is what is common consumption. If we will use what we already have, or, I mean current uh, modern technologies, then it's blue bars. And if you will uh, invest more money in R&D, uh, then you can see the green bar can substantially reduce the energy consumption uh, in the manufacturing sector. Okay, uh, then why we used fossil fuels? Uh, because they're cheap. Uh, and uh, with uh, renewables uh, sources of energy, the cost was falling uh, in the last years. And on the diagram on the left side, you can see that our solar and the wind already below coal and they're even sometimes below natural gas, electricity cost. Okay, our, so if you have cheap electricity, we have for, uh, to choose between two ways of decarbonization. We can still use fossil fuels and uh, use carbon sequestration or, and storage or we can use uh, renewable electricity to directly uh, use in uh, industrial processes. And uh, this is uh, from uh, McKinsey report, uh, which says that at zero uh, carbon electricity prices below $50 per megawatt hour, uh, the 
to use uh, this zero carbon electricity would be actually cheaper, more economical than the use of fossil fuels with uh, carbon sequestration. You know, or, and the, the prices, as I said, already below $50 per megawatt hour and going lower and lower. So we have for this uh, inexpensive uh, renewable electricity, so what we can do with this, this uh, surplus, uh, and we can build, of course, more uh, wind farms and solar farms. Okay, uh, power to heat. Currently, uh, I showed you on previous slides, it was a lot of uh, heat generated from fossil fuels, uh, just combustion. So what, what we can do if we have electricity, we can do localized heat. Omic heat, uh, we can use actually the intermediate like hydrogen or uh, in combust, uh, combust zero carbon hi uh, hydrogen or uh, in uh, industrial processes. In power to hydrogen, uh, we can replace the current SMR process or uh, coal gasification uh, with water electrolysis. And uh, power to commodities, we can replace uh, thermal and catalytical processes uh, with, uh, again, using either hydrogen as intermediate or other fuels, uh, and produce uh, commodities, uh, which we consider to be fuels, or stainless steel uh, and metals uh, and cement. And finally, uh, we can uh, use uh, renewable electricity to generate uh, specialties, uh, high-value products directly uh, using electricity. Again, replacing uh, thermal and catalytical processes uh, with uh, uh, electricity. At the next uh, slide, uh, I will just show you example, uh, power to hydrogen. So we have, for example, wind farm. We use uh, electrolyzer, which is uh, can, uh, the technology we already know, and we improve on this. The hydrogen can be stored and can be used uh, for, to generate heat, to generate uh, uh, fuels, for example, to generate chemicals, uh, to mix uh, with the natural gas or biogas and used for, again, for the heating. Uh, so there is multiple uh, uses of, of this uh, hydrogen if we can produce it economically. Right now, we still cannot do it, but we are working. So benefits for uh, electrification of industrial sector. First, we can increase uh, the efficiency, reduce our energy consumption by 40-60%. We can reduce CO2 emissions, or we can effectively use our intermittent energy oversupply, which we generated more and more uh, uh, with the years. Uh, and also, if we can use our more clean, uh, efficient process, we will, generate, uh, we will reduce our associated emissions, like NOx, for example. We also can enable long-term energy storage and uh, keep uh, this energy ready for our needs in the future. Okay, so, and finally, let's uh, look at uh, what uh, RPAE is doing already or could do in this area. Uh, for example, the conversion of renewable electricity to fuels or in the fuel program, it's already there, but it uh, was targeted mostly transportation. Are with ionics uh, generating hydrogen, but we can do steel production, cement production, building heating, manufacturing processes. Okay, and uh, I would like to finish uh, with a citation uh, again from McKinsey report, which says after breakthrough in the power, transport, and building sectors, industrial decarbonization is the next frontier. So, any suggestions? Talk to me, and thank you. And uh, now it's my pleasure to reintroduce Rachel Slaver. Thanks so much. Good morning. So Grigori talked about what we can do with more electricity and some ways to make it. And I'm going to talk about some other ideas. I'm Rachel Slaybaugh, and I'm here to talk to you today about how can we think about making nuclear reactors much cheaper to operate and maintain so they'll be available for us to get a 100% clean energy future. And I'm really here to get your ideas about how we can make this happen. So as we've heard this week, getting to a fully decarbonized economy is not a simple lift. We have electricity, we have transportation, we have construction and materials, all of it. 
And correspondingly, we need all of the energy resources to get there. We need solar and wind and thermal, um, battery storage, nuclear, fossil with CCS. We probably need all of it. And most studies have found that the fastest and cheapest and simplest way to get there involves having dispatchable resources for about a third of our electricity. Dispatchable resources include nuclear energy. And as you've heard from several speakers this week, nuclear energy needs to be a choice that we can make to get to our clean energy future as fast as possible. So when I talk about nuclear energy, what am I talking about? So there's what we have today, which is what we call generation three reactors. There's what we're building right now, which are generation three plus. There are advanced light water reactors, like the new scale system you heard about on Monday. And there are generation four reactors, and that's what I call advanced reactors. So when I say advanced reactors, I mean anything that does not use water to transfer heat from the core to generate power. That can be lead, molten salt, gas, um, heat pipes, and all of these choices have different features. So if these ideas don't sound new, we have built and operated most of these reactors in the 1950s in an experimental fashion, but none of them gained wide deployment. We're interested in them again today because of the features that they have to offer. They, they all operate at higher temperatures, so they are available for industrial process heat. One of the things we're going to need for full decarbonization is high temperature heat for industrial processes. Many of them can either directly load follow or use thermal storage to complement intermittent resources like renewables. Many of them have more compelling economic cases. And some of them can burn up nuclear waste. And finally, we have a variety of size options for this next set of reactors so they can fit into a larger variety of markets. So what's changed is that we've done you know, some tech development in the last 70 years in terms of computing and materials so that we can now look at these newly. And there's a huge demand for all of these resources if we're going to get to 100% clean energy. So right now, there is a new and expanding innovation ecosystem in nuclear energy. And so when I entered the field 15 years ago, that was not a thing. And now there are startups and there are serious innovation efforts inside of existing companies to bring new ideas to fruition. They're raising private capital and they're trying to redefine how we do development and deployment in nuclear energy. So it's been a really exciting time. Um, despite my enthusiasm, however, the future of nuclear energy in the United States is not totally clear. As many of you may be familiar, uh, about a fifth of the reactor fleet is going to have shut down prematurely by 2025. And for perspective, that is the same amount of clean energy as twice what we produce with solar. So why is that happening? So if you compare the levelized cost of electricity of a current nuclear reactor to other new generation sources, the total LCOE is quite low. It's in this circled bit. But if you look at the fixed O&M costs, operations and maintenance costs, it's comparatively very high. And that matters because that is the marginal cost that is being constantly accrued. So in some markets, nuclear reactors are not cost competitive because the fixed O&M is very high. And now, right next to it, I have advanced reactors. And these are cost projections. So you can see that the LCOE is higher. And that's because existing reactors have the capital costs all paid off. In new ones, you'll have to pay the capital costs. The fixed O&M is projected to go down, but it's not projected to go down far enough. The good news is most of those numbers are kind of made up uh, because all of these reactors are very much in development. The designs are not fully detailed, so the cost projections are not very solid. In particular, the ins and outs of O&M and how that's going to happen is really not figured out. And so the opportunity, and why I'm here talking to you, is because if we start thinking right now how to do the ops and maintenance on these plants, we can change their designs and set them up for a different cost curve so they can be relevant in the future. And there's more good news. There we go. Uh, reducing costs and optimizing operations is a thing that is happening widely in the industrial sector. There's all kinds of cool stuff going on right now. Asset performance maintenance, where you use data and predictions about projected futures to change how you're going to operate your system. So for example, a wind farm implemented asset performance management and was able to produce more electricity, the equivalent of adding 70 megawatts of new generation. Predictive maintenance is a subset of APM, 
And that allows you to use uh, active models of what's really happening in the system. So you only do maintenance when you need to, instead of having time-based maintenance using conservative assumptions. So a PDM program on trial at a nuclear plant was able to save half a million dollars over two months. And finally, autonomy and automation is being implemented mostly everywhere, and that can really reduce personnel costs. So solar plants have inverters that automatically operate and maintain, and under normal conditions just report what happened, and you don't need to deploy anyone to the field. And so what I'm thinking about is how much can we immediately adopt those technologies into advanced reactors, and where are their development gaps? So those are some of the questions I have for you. Where does it translate directly, and where, where do we need to fill in some pieces? And beyond the ops and maintenance for sort of balance of plant, we also need to operate the reactor itself. And a lot of people are talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. So sorting out where we need which one, sorting out how to deal with when we're training, when we want to operate something outside of its training set. Um, what data do we need to what fidelity? These reactors haven't been built yet. So to what extent can we leverage synthetic data and under what conditions? The models that we have of advanced reactors have some real uncertainties in them. So how do we use those appropriately and in what operational contexts? And finally, predictive maintenance is still relatively new. It's usually applied to single pieces of equipment and for limited failure modalities. What does it look like to apply predictive maintenance to an entire nuclear reactor? So those and kind of those categories of questions are the ones I'm really interested in talking with you about. So hopefully you're starting to consider the idea that advanced reactors might be a really essential piece of our clean energy future. And further, hopefully you're asking yourselves questions about how would you optimize operations to make those things operate really effectively so that we can take advantage of their technical benefits and have them be a good economic choice at the same time. So please email me your thoughts. We will all be available outside of the ballroom for discussion after this, so please Send me your thoughts and input. Thank you for your time and attention. And next up, Scott Shu. Good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Shu. I'm a program director at RPE, and today I'm going to talk about enabling Fusion's Kitty Hawk moment. Sorry, I jumped the gun here. Many people think that the Kitty Hawk moment for fusion will be when we are able to demonstrate net energy gain for a brief duration. And when this happens, we think that private industry uh, may step in and take us all the way to the finish line of, of a demonstration grid ready uh, demo. And as I'll discuss in this fast pitch, there are uh, technical R&D opportunities, we think, both for getting us to the Kitty Hawk moment but also to catalyze the development of many of the enabling technologies that will be needed to get to that grid-ready demo. And so part of the message I want you all to take away is we, we want to engage not only with people in the fusion R&D community, but with people outside and beyond the fusion R&D community who have tackled similar problems uh, that we're going to encounter. So fusion, as most of you well know, is the process that powers the sun and the stars, fusing hydrogen into helium other, and other heavier elements, and in the process, releasing, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. If we, can control, if we can achieve controlled fusion energy on Earth, it has the potential essentially to provide us limitless energy, carbon-free, highly dispatchable, safe 24-7. I mean, that's why people think it's the holy grail of energy. So at an agency like ARPA-E, where we do many, many different energy technologies, it's worth asking the question, why is ARPA-E doing fusion energy? Many of us in this room, if not at this entire summit, of course, we're working on an, a very immediate challenge which is achieving zero to negative emissions across all energy sectors in a cost-effective manner. And we need to do this by mid-century, if not earlier. But the challenges are so tough, it may take until late century. How can fusion help here? You know, the limited 
there's a limited solution space to achieving this objective, as, as Rachel has mentioned. We need to do an all of the above. But if each of these pathways have a finite chance of success of scaling up to the scales we need, we need to pursue as many of these options as possible. And perhaps that, that's the best nearest term reason for pursuing fusion, as part of a mix to increase the chances that we'll get to our objective by mid or late century. But in particular, fusion may be good for some of the very difficult, to, uh, difficult sectors to get to zero carbon. Uh, for example, one of the things Gregory talked about. Fusion can potentially provide very high temperature uh, heat for industrial processes, as well as generating synthetic fuel for transportation. Now, in the long term, of course, fusion has the potential to secure a clean energy future for humanity essentially forever. I mean, who here remembers the 1985 film Back to the Future, uh, when Doc Emmett Brown comes back from the future and has outfitted his DeLorean with Mr. Fusion? Now, physics may preclude something like Mr. Fusion itself. However, Mr. Fusion is symbolic of a future where energy is no longer a source of geopolitical conflict, and also it can un uh, open up untold number of applications. Large-scale water desalinization, a deep manned space flight, um, generation of synthetic fuel, etc. Things we haven't even imagined today. So after 60 plus years of controlled fusion research, we're on the cusp of fusion's Kitty Hawk moment, which as I mentioned earlier, is when fusion demonstrates net energy gain for a brief duration. But everyone in this room has probably heard the quip that fusion is always 30 years away. And unfortunately, there's truth to that statement, but not without reason. For the early, and as this plot shows, this is a key metric for fusion, the fusion triple product. In the early decades of fusion development, from the 50s all the way up to the 90s, you can see actually there was rapid progress made uh, in the very tough problem of heating the fusion fuel in the plasma state uh, up to 100 million degrees. An entire discipline of plasma physics was invented essentially to tackle this problem. And in fact, the rate of progress there exceeded that of Moore's law. But since then, we've, we've still been waiting another 20 years and probably another 20 more. And the reason for that is the lowest scientific risk path to Fusion's Kitty Hawk moment is via ITER, which is a multinational project being built in France at a cost of tens of billions of dollars and taking multiple decades. And if things go well there, it may be close to 2040 before we have Fusion's Kitty Hawk moment. So today, there are a growing number of other efforts, including privately funded fusion companies. And they all recognize that, uh, taking the lessons from fission, that reduced nameplate generation capacity, reduced capital cost, are going to be needed if fusion is going to be successful in having impact. And so these companies, and I want to give out a shout out to the Fusion Industry Association, of which many of these private companies are members. Most of these companies are pursuing a direct path to potentially commercially viable fusion via two paths, A and B here, as seen in the plot. The first is advancing the heating and confinement performance of lower cost but lower maturity approaches. And these approaches have inherently reduced size and complexity, such that if we can get them to the Kitty Hawk moment, they will have a smoother path to an actual demonstration power plant. Others are taking the most mature concept, the tokamak, and, and bringing in outside developments, for example, high temperature superconducting magnets, to shrink the size of the leading approach to tokamak. And they also want to take a direct path to commercially viable fusion, and hopefully to leapfrog eater. So what can we do to help these efforts? So for path A, it's about accelerating the development of these lower TRL, but very attractive concepts. And so some of the things, and, and that image kind of shows the diverse range of ideas people are working on. 
What we can do at ARPA E is to help define impactful technical milestones and hold the development uh, to those milestones. We wish to leverage the very deep and broad expertise at our labs and universities to help these efforts. We want to apply state-of-the-art tools, including diagnostics and computational models, and also the transformative uses of things like machine learning to really accelerate the development cycle. But getting to the Kitty Hawk moment is not going to be enough. We also need to catalyze development of key enabling technologies so that a grid-ready demonstration can be achieved in a timely manner after that Kitty Hawk moment is reached. Now, I'm out of time, but this graph shows that you know, we've been focused mostly on that DT Fusion core. The whole surrounding system, as you can see in all the yellow bubbles there, these are technologies that we need to make possible. And so we can catalyze development of these areas today so that they become available when the Kitty Hawk moment is reached. And these are especially the areas we would like to reach out to outside industries, people who have tackled similar problems already. We don't want to invent, reinvent the wheel. So please contact me to provide input and to engage. Thank you very much. Next up, my colleague, Michael Hadi. Thank you. OK, from fusion to next generation HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, can we make these systems a lot smarter, a lot smaller, and more adaptive? And is it an ARPA hard problem? This is one sector that I hope everyone in the room can resonate to. We use it in your workspace. We use it in the car that you drive to the airport as you fly with your airline. And when you go home, start thinking about how can we change um, the HVAC systems. Um, is it potentially of interest to ARPA-E? Yes, currently 6.3 quads of energy consumption. But no matter whose report you look at, it's booming. And the current market for HVAC equipment is 120 billion, jump into 167 billion by 2024. So 7% annual growth rate for this sector. So ARPA is interested because we have tremendous potential to increase the efficiency, therefore reduce carbon emissions. Um, what more is important is the fact that across the globe, distribution of ownership is very different. Japan at 90%, US at 87%. China only 60%, India only 6%. But people have realized that HVAC is to provide optimum heat, optimum comfort, optimum humidity in a space. Therefore, comfort is equal to productivity. So these countries all are investing in infrastructure to improve the status of air conditioning and built environment systems. So we have to be mindful if U.S. is to gain the market share that it has lost over years in this sector. Many of these systems also use refrigerants. Um, refrigerants are not environmentally benign. As you can see here, they have global warming potential across residential sectors, across commercial sector. So if you go do something to reduce the amount of refrigerant charge, you have done something good, not only from emission point of view, but also the new refrigerants are, listen to this, 10 to 12 times more expensive than the existing refrigerants 410, R134A, and so forth that you're familiar with. So there's economics involved, there's environment involved, there's market share loss involved. US companies have a tough time selling overseas. Our systems are noisy, our systems are not slick enough, our systems are not small enough. But what we have, is an industry that has been thriving many years in the US, and we can, with our PAE help, perhaps we can get it back. So here is a uh, short course on HVAC. A typical refrigeration HVAC system is nothing but a couple of heat exchangers, a very small device compressor that pushes the fluid through the loop, and you have an expansion device between the high side and the low side pressure. You go to the chiller for this building, you just increase the size, Instead of a fan, you use a cooling tower. And instead of a um, small heat exchanger, you use a chiller with a 1,000 tubes in it, evaporating or condensing and so forth. Um, so start thinking how we could tremendously change it. As you can see here, more than 80% of the charge is in the evaporator and condenser. 
So um, looking at possible areas, immediately come into your mind. I have listed these areas here, but um, I do not want you to think just on this because there are many things that you could um, start thinking about. We talked about super wood yesterday. Can we talk about super working fluid, including super water? Can you think about a situation where instead of six to eight degrees um, temperature for chilled water today, I can push it down to minus six to eight degrees C without freezing and without ethylene glycol, because ethylene glycol kills the excellent properties of water. <coughs> okay. So, but on top of the line is substantially reduce the refrigerant charge. You may ask uh, what is substantial, and I will say an order of magnitude. Substantially shrink the size of the system, and so what is substantial? I say bring it to one quarter of the size today and less than 50% weight. That would shrink the size of the system footprint, would reduce the cost, would reduce international appeal. Of course, we have to improve the COP of the system because COP is equal to energy efficiency, is equal to regulations, and we want certainly go beyond regulations and have system that can sell overseas as well. Cost sensitive, yes, ARPA is also cost sensitive. We have to develop technologies that we have a roadmap to commercialization, so that would be important. And finally, are these systems smart enough today? Think about your own thermostat, think about the big system. No, we are not really using adaptive systems. In US, we are using on and off. So either you shut the system off, the thermostat asks for it, you turn it on. That's not, heat exchanger is not conforming, heat exchanger is not communicating. Compressor is smart, the rest of the system is pretty, sorry, dumb. Um, so let me give you one case study in terms of the possibilities, and that is um, how we, a recent patent on how we could reduce the size. So we have to think about uh, innovative design, innovative materials, and manufacturing. So typical big chilling in a system, as I mentioned, has a thousand tubes in it. Upper two banks performs better than middle row than the bottom row. They're not communicating with each other. Heat exchangers are well done braced and pretty much um, communicationless. So in this work, we'll use additive manufacturing and design a jacket for each tube. Instead of letting these tubes pool in a big bath of refrigerants, we have a situation where every tube in that thousand tube is fed with a jacket made of polymer, dirty and expensive to make. However, a lot of complicated um, heat transfer knowledge and design goes into that. In, that, um, in the backup slides that you will receive one, once our party releases the slides, you will see the work as to developing multi-phase flow and so forth, not fully developed multi-phase flow, but what is the result? The result is process intensification. As you can see, flow comes in after a short while, I have total control over the nucleation, the bubble frequency, the size of the, the bubbles, specifically tailored to the working fluid you are using. If it's R134A, it's a different jacket design. If it's R22, it's a different jacket design. But looking at this is a lot more intensified. It's a situation that you hope every work mo molecule of the working fluid is working for you. So comparison, um, hopefully the chart is not complicated enough. You have two um, charts, two graphs on the bottom. These are the tubes, thin tube and plain tube. Without jacket, I put the jacket on top of them. Look what happens to the heat transfer coefficient. 3,000 watts per meter square degree K jumps to 30,000 watts per meter square degree K. I did not change technology. I'm using state-of-the-art tubes. All I did was better flow distribution. Okay, so what else happens if you did that for this particular evaporator? Look at, these are experimentally driven data. The size less than half, refrigerant charge reduced to 10% of what you would use in pool boiling. Cost definitely comes down because the system is smaller now. I have a lot less refrigerant in there. And yes, I did improve <coughs> COP by 15%. So this was one case study in terms of the first item that I listed on that list of five areas to think about. And with that, I certainly hope that many of you in the room start thinking now how you could help this very broad industry, how U.S. can get some of its market share back, and I would look forward to hearing from you on this. Thank you very much. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Thiel, my colleague. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> my name is Greg Thiel, and 
I'm a fellow at RPE, and today what I'd like to talk to you about is a pile of dirty laundry. The bane of our weekend to-dos, the source of strife in relationships, and a significant cost on American household electricity bills. But drying isn't just a big energy sink in our homes. It's a big energy sink in our industries as well. And so what I hope you'll take away from my talk today is that I think some of the most interesting technologies for reducing that energy footprint involve drying without the application of heat. So let's start with something familiar, the clothes dryer. This one appliance uses a full 66 terawatt hours of electrical equivalents in the United States per year. It emits about 30 to 40 megatons of CO2 per year. And as I mentioned a minute ago, it costs the average American household about 5 to 10% of their electricity bill. And these numbers don't include the AC load required to cool your house down after you heat it up with a warm load of laundry. They don't include hotels like the one we're staying at here or commercial laundries. So it's a big energy user. But the good news is we've made some progress. If you look at standard electric dryers, which are the most commonly used type in the US today, they consume about two to four kilowatt hours per load per cycle. But now on the market today, we're seeing things like heat pump dryers. Now these dryers don't vent the moist air out to the environment, but rather they condense the moisture out of the air and recirculate the still warm air to reduce the amount of energy required to dry. These technologies reduce the energy consumption by about 40 to 60%. And in R&D, we see technologies like ultrasonics, which don't use heat at all to dry clothes, but rather use ultrasonic waves to pulse moisture out of clothes in the form of very fine droplets, like a, like a mist or a fog. So the thing is, when you see a staircase like that, the question that naturally arises is, is uh, how low can you go? And since I'm a mechanical engineer, um, when I think about how low I can go and, and, and where I am today, the thing that comes to mind is not a limbo stick, but uh, uh, the metric called efficiency, right? And efficiency for a process that consumes energy is def defined as the minimum energy required by physics or by thermodynamics divided by the actual energy consumed by the process. So the question for drying here is, is what is that minimum thermodynamic minimum energy required? And the answer to that question lies in the relative humidity, which, as we all, of course, remember, is defined as the partial pressure of water vapor in air divided by the partial pressure of water vapor in air and a, and a mass of air that is saturated with water at a particular temperature. This is a number that varies between 0 and 1, between 0 and 100%. When it's less than 100%, the puddle on the ground disappears. And when it's 100%, the puddle remains a puddle. The thing is, of course, if you look at a map of relative humidity in the lower 48, and you look at it on an annual average basis, what you see is that everywhere, it's pretty much less than 100%. So what that means is drying clothes is thermodynamically free, right? So, so what that means for us is that the, the benchmark on our efficiency metric isn't a consumption of energy at all, but rather a production of energy. What it means is that the potential for energy savings in this space is greater than 100%, right? So, and this, this, this makes sense to everyone, right? You hang your clothes out to dry and they dry. Um, but the point here really is that we're spending a lot of energy to speed up a process that occurs spontaneously. And you know, although the situation isn't completely analogous in the industrial sector, the opportunity for savings here is even bigger. The removal of water and organic compounds to form a dry product in the manufacturing sector consumes a full 1.2 quads of primary energy in the United States per year. Here, too, we've seen some progress. And the progress runs the gamut. We've seen everything from process changes, upstream process changes, like in the automotive industry, where new paint formulations have allowed successful layers of wet paint to be applied without drying in between. This reduces the amount of drying steps required, and of course, therefore, also the amount of energy used in drying. 
We've seen technologies that use low or zero carbon energy to dry, like solar dryers. We've seen enhanced heating technologies, like superheated steam drying, which, has, which instead of drying in a, in a hot air environment, dries in a hot steam environment, which has better heat transfer characteristics and allows the energy associated with the vaporization of water to be more easily recycled. And two, in, in the industrial space, we've seen the application of ultrasonics and other electrically driven methods. But the thing is, it's not enough. As Grigori alluded to at the beginning of this session, um, the greenhouse gas emissions in the industrial sector are massive. If you look at a plot of direct emissions from that sector, you'll see that they've been stagnant at about 1.5 gigatons per year in the US for the past decade. So what can we do? Well, I think maybe one answer to that question lies back in my pile of dirty clothes. And the, the question I would pose here is, is to ask yourself, what's the difference between the image on the left-hand side of the screen and the image on the right-hand side of the screen? And the difference isn't that the pile on the clothes on the right-hand side of the screen is folded, and it's not that it's warm and fuzzy and cozy, like putting on a hot robe straight out of the dryer on a cold winter's day. The difference between these two images is water, not heat. And so, what I'm interested in hearing more from you about today and in the future is how we can build out the non-evaporative drying portfolio. How we can begin to think of vaporization of water as just one tool in a toolbox of options to make a dry product by moving water. How can we begin to decouple the notions of heating and drying? So my ask for you today is if you're interested in advancing our drying technologies toolbox, if you're interested in making drying low energy and low carbon, or if you're just interested in rethinking thermal energy use in our industries, please come talk to me. Please send me your thoughts, your ideas, your white papers at the address shown on the screen. Thank you very much. So I failed to mention this at the beginning, but as a reminder, we welcome audience questions. Please text them to the number that might be on the screen soon. <laughs> 222333. And remember, they have to be text like 160 characters or less. So we have a couple that have come in so far. So we'll start with Greg, fresh in our minds. Are you telling us we should all just hang our clothes out to dry? <laughs> uh, uh, no, so I'll go on the record saying no. Um, the, the, I think there, there are many good reasons to, to use a dryer, you know, I mean, not least of which in the homes, you know, mold buildup in, in industries, land use and, and product quality and, and on and on and on. So I'm definitely not saying that. I think um, the point I'm just trying to make is that, you know, we, when we dry, we dry using a very energy intensive method, the, the vaporization of water. And if we can, if we can really um, advance technologies that can move water fully out of, out of products, out of materials to achieve a dry state while that water is still in the liquid phase, we stand to save a lot of energy. Grigori, how will electrification of the industrial sector be affected by successful electrification of other sectors? All right, it's a good question. Uh, and there, I already mentioned that uh, a couple of RPE programs uh, work actually targeting the transportation sector. Uh, they are target producing produce fuel from renewable uh, electricity and hydrogen from renewable electricity. And the fuels and hydrogen could be used in the electrification of industrial sector. Uh, but of course, uh, it's just a scratch uh, on the surface. Uh, we also need to develop a program would be specific, specifically target industrial industrial sector. Mike, you mentioned possible size reduction for HVAC systems, but the weak air side heat transfer limits further size reduction. How would you address this limitation? Also, good question. Excellent question. Excellent question. So. This is when you talk to industry, that's really the question that comes up. As one of my colleagues said, when you try to sell research to industry, it's playing cards. So you offer a solution and they come back 
and put a block in there in terms of um, how it cannot be done. Um, there is an RPOE, there was an RPOE project uh, on air side enhancement with uh, James Clausen, our program director. Their experimentally um, RPOE project demonstrated 11 times improvement in heat transfer coefficient on the air side through additive manufacturing. Um, so we are talking about systems that are more sophisticated, but at the same time more reliable. So I, I don't think it's a showstop. And we need to think different. We need to think about completely different packaging so that the fin design would be accommodating with the weakness of the air as a working fluid. Great. And a question for me. What are some of the barriers to developing the O&M technologies that I was talking about? Um, there are several, but one of the biggest barriers is really integration of skill sets across somewhat disparate fields. So a lot of people working on AI and machine learning and model-based fault detection are not thinking about nuclear energy or, and often even the industrial sector at all. And so one of the really big challenges is getting people developing fantastic solutions for other problem sets to consider nuclear, and for nuclear to reach out and be willing to admit that perhaps they don't have all of the answers and they need to integrate um, with other sectors and, and take advantage of those lessons. Um, so text questions, 22333. So I don't have any more questions. If you could ask yourself the perfect question, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, <clears throat> there's several questions people ask about fusion. Um, one is, why is there private capital going into fusion when it seems so far from commercialization? And that's a good question. I mean, it's kind of an amazing phenomenon. But I think it's a confluence of several factors. One is just the really the tremendous reward of fusion. You know, it is high risk, but the reward is is even higher. So the overall risk to reward ratio actually maybe becomes palatable to investors. Uh, but secondly, I think it's also just the growing urgency of, of the climate problem and, and carbon emissions, et cetera. And we just need more solutions to, to help solve the problem. So I think those are two two reasons to answer that question. New questions. Um, Greg, compared to something like transportation, the energy put footprint for drying seems fairly small. Why is this a good space for RPE? Uh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think first of all, I would say that you know this is part of the bigger grand challenge of, of industrial carbon decarbonization. And um, it's a really tough space because it's, it's very piecemeal. Um, and because it's very piecemeal, you have a lot of these kind of smaller opportunities, and those are harder for, for the private sector to attack. You have lock-in. You have um, uh, cheap thermal energy today. And so uh, I think for, for that reason, it means that RPE uh, must engage in that area in order for us to, to achieve uh, and, and go bit by bit, go go bit by bit through these piecemeal sectors in order to achieve that larger, uh, greater goal. Grigori, how is the intermittent nature of renewables going to affect the electrification of the industrial sector? Oh, this is an excellent question because, uh, of course, uh, when we look at the all industrial process, they are working the best in a steady state or uh, in uh, any interruption startup or uh, a shutdown procedure uh, goes uh, into lose uh, into lesser efficiency in lo uh, in losses in production uh, and so forth so to avoid uh, this in the kind of intermittency question we either have to design a process which will not be affected, like, for example, electrolysis of water cannot be affected much because it could be started and shut down in, in a second. 
our end we are, but uh, I guess uh, the solution would be in our development of our inexpensive and effective energy storage associated uh, with uh, uh, renewable uh, generation and electrification of industry. And actually this is our kind of our answer on my previous question as well, how uh, other, uh, you know, RPA program can benefit industrial <coughs> sector electrification, like energy storage. Yes, definitely it could. Okay. Mike, how would AI have a role in next generation HVAC? Because it has a role in everything, it seems. Great, potentially a great question. <coughs> so as I said earlier, shutting off and shutting on is not uh, AI. Um, it's plenty of room. Um, some of the U.S. companies, HVAC companies, have started collecting data, uh, not to mention names, but they already have 1,000 buildings that they're monitoring, they're taking data on. Um, I would immediately can think about a situation where you use the weather forecast to prepare the building, including thermal energy storage, so that the building is adaptive. If there is a cold front coming in, the building will start preparing. In that case, heat exchanger has to be ready. Heat exchanger cannot be a well embraced piece of equipment. The system as a whole has to be adaptive, and I really think that tremendous potential in AI for this um, HVAC sector. We can discuss more. And one more. Would a possible next-gen HVAC consider non-vapor compression solutions? Another great question. I, I did not say I'm promoting vapor compression. Um, but it is it is majority of systems out there now think about non-vapor compression solutions as well. Um, compressor takes a lot of power. If you could go to situations where you're doing uh, pumping instead of compressing, you could save energy. Um, so certainly, non-vapor compression systems are welcome. All right, and then one more for me. Um, you mentioned several reactor types. How translatable are these ideas across types? It's a good question. So it, it depends. Um, what I'm most interested in is ideas that can sort of be abstracted so that you can apply them to any of the reactor futures, because it's really unclear which reactor type might gain market share in the future, or if a variety of them will. And obviously, some solutions are going to be particular. I mean, these different reactor types are quite different from one another. Some of them have solid fuel with a gas fluid material, a gas heat transfer fluid. Some of them have a liquid fuel in a liquid heat transfer fluid. Um, so it, it depends, but what we're most interested in is ideas that you can at least abstract so that the frameworks will apply across technologies. And um, ooh, what do you think is the most attractive electricity market segment for fusion to fill first? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I mean, we're, we're thinking about that harder. Um, you know, up to this point, it's been a bit hand wavy. People just expect that some centralized power generation is the obvious market for fusion, but we know the economics isn't very easy there. Um, so we're looking at all sorts of things, uh, you know, remote operations, Ford military type things for smaller size. One thing I should say is that, you know, with the range of fusion concepts being explored, they all naturally, if they work out, may fill different sized segments and, and with different requirements. So we're trying to identify all those various potential mappings of the types of concepts with the different types of uh, market segments. So in reality, the segments will, will hopefully, if, if many of these concepts might work out, we can span the entire spectrum of micro reactor all the way to centralized generation for dense population centers. But more work, I think we need to do more work uh, on the tech to market aspect of things to really identify um, you know, what the best near term options are. Gregory, are there any land use concerns if we electrified all US industry? Land? land use, so like the land required to make all that electricity. Yes, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, calculations and analysis uh, how much land there should be used. And if I remember correctly, the uh, state of Nevada will uh, cover the whole United States uh, energy needs. 
sorry, it's not as big. And especially, of course, we will not take uh, a big patch of land. It will be a distributed generation. Great. Um, Greg, what is your view on solar thermal for process heating? What is the? Solar thermal for process heating. What do you think? Uh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I mean I think the only the only challenge with with um, solar thermal or or maybe any sort of direct uh, solar input as 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 process heat is is that um, it has to be co-located with with wherever um, w with your factory uh, and so if the solar resource isn't there or if it's prohibitively expensive then it's nice to be able to have um, electrified alternatives. Okay, there's one more question. It's thinking very hard about coming through. Okay. Um, at what point will HVAC improvements be undermined by poor building design? What, it, what is that trade-off of HVAC versus building design? With the building design? Mm -hmm. um, again, this is a sector that um, really has not been very, innovation has lacked. Um, so today, about 25%, 20, 25% of the space is lost to the docks that distribute the air. Can we do something different? Um, from the question that came in, do you allow vapor compression and so forth? Seems like a lot of us are thinking about cooling, but I want you to think about heating. Heating is a lot more at the global level than cooling is in terms of consumption. I think in the US might be 37% of your energy bill is heating, 23% is cooling. Um, today I'm burning, particularly in the US, I'm burning natural gas at 3,000 degrees C or coal and so forth because the room needs 25 degrees C. This is very inefficient. So we really need to think about buildings, being adaptive, having thermology storage, and increasingly think about heat pumping because heat pumping can be used for cooling and heating. The rest of the globe is a lot, is a lot more progressive in this use of heat pumps, um, and there's a lot of room. So one for me, a great question, why are O&M costs so high for nuclear reactors right now? And a combination of reasons, one of them is these plants were built a long time ago with analog technology, and so everything is done manually. There is no automatic digital data collection. You have people physically walking the plants and taking readings. Um, a lot of maintenance is prescriptive and preventative. So every 18 months, the reactor goes down to refuel it, and you do all of the maintenance, whether it needs to be done or not. You tear the pump apart, you clean the pump, you put the pump back together. So there's a tremendous amount of manual, like physically intense maintenance that happens. Um, and some of that is imposed by regulation, some of that is imposed by culture. Um, but a lot of it just has to do with technologies from 40 years ago and what we are set up to do in the system. So the costs are really just physically people taking water samples and reading charts and processing that data. Um, Scott, why is so much private capital going into fusion, even though commercialization seems so far off? Well, I guess that, that's the question I answered for myself first, right? Uh, but, but maybe I'll take the opportunity to go back to the other question and say, in terms of markets for fusion, um, that high heat, industrial uh, heat is something that we really want to look into more because not only is that a hard to decarbonize sector that fusion could potentially fulfill, but also it actually greatly eases the technical burden of fusion because you don't have to go through the efficiency losses of electricity conversion. Okay. And our last question also for you, how can non-plasma physicists help fusion? And can you tell us more about the needs for innovation? Yes, so thanks, especially because I ran out of time at the end. Especially on the enabling technology piece, we need the non-plasma physicists especially. And I'll just mention the two greatest problems have to do with breeding the tritium fuel and processing that tritium. So you need to extract it out of your uh, primary coolant. You need to keep the tritium contained where you want it, and you need to take it out where you want to take it out and not have it leak into the environment. So that's... That's a problem entirely not for plasma physicists. It's for people who have de dealt with hydrogen processing at high temperatures. There's overlap with uh, advanced fission um, uh, concepts. 
And the other thing that's really the greatest need is how do you face the extreme heat and particle flux coming from that fusion core and whether that first uh, interface is a solid, is a liquid, is some kind of extruded, continuously extruded medium. These are all things that we need innovations for and we don't just want to think that it, there's some magical material that's going to survive that. We need more ideas there. All right. And that's our time. Thank you so much for your time and engagement. We will all be available afterwards outside the foyer and by email. Thank you so much.